أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين with the last name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. The praise belongs to God, the Lord of all systems and knowledge. The merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, soul judge on the day of judgment. We worship you only and we turn to your begging assistance. Guide us on the straight way, the way of those on whom you bestowed blessings, not those who incur your wrath, not those who go astray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Omar. With the law's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, I openly bear witness that there is but one God, the one and only creator of the heavens and earth, the Lord of all systems of knowledge, whom we properly call Allah. I accept all of Allah's prophets and believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a mercy to mankind and the seal of prophethood. Assalamu alaikum, dear family. It is so nice to be with you again. Um, and I just want to say that this is the, you know, seeing Sunday and seeing all of your faces is such an inspiration to each and every one of us. You can feel that spirit and the announcement uh, when you come online and tell us where you're from. So we are all so grateful. So today our speaker is Ambassador Walid, and his topic is West African Opportunities, Exploring Business on the Continent. He is one of our uh, second generation Muslims, uh, his parents came through the Nation of Islam, and we want to acknowledge the work that he does and is doing, he and his wife. So a uh, welcome, Ambassador Walid. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Fitra. Thank you so much for the invitation to share today. I'm truly honored and excited to see so many of our senior members and our Muslim brothers and sisters from all over the country. It's just warming my heart. So thank you very much. Are most welcome. Please, uh, you can begin your presentation. Okay. I'm going to share a PowerPoint and just run through about 10 or 15 slides and then um, leave some time for Q&A towards the conclusion. Uh, so again, I'm Wally Shamsuddin, and my title is Special Envoy and Ambassador for Trade and Investment for the Republic of Sierra Leone. Sister Fitra did an introduction about the family and the family business. So I want to jump right into the presentation. We have a lot to discuss today in the form of opportunities. Uh, so I want to start with saying um, investing abroad, expanding into multinational opportunities creates an opportunity to build economic development, improve our community, and empower our community by exploring opportunities on the continent. I was blessed to travel and visit over 40 countries around the world. And the more I travel and the more I visit, the more humble I become, but the more opportunities I see for our community and for our people. Today's conversation is really about West Africa. And ECOWAS uh, stands for Economic Community of West African States. There are about 15 countries of the 54 on the continent um, that represents West Africa and have agreements for bilateral trade, uh, for commerce, for tourism, and for travel. These 15 countries, we can get in with a visa upon arrival, and they can trade and travel without visas uh, between Benin, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, the Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, Sierra Leone, and Togo. And I'm, I'm giving special interest to Sierra Leone because I was able to trace my DNA back on my mother's side, on my maternal side to Sierra Leone. And I visited and had an opportunity to meet with the president and explore specific investment opportunities for Sierra Leone. So we'll, we'll spend a little time talking about the opportunities in Sierra Leone 
as well as uh, Senegal specifically. From a development perspective, um, for those of you all who have not traveled, once you get outside of the United States, it's different banking opportunities. We, you know, most of us are familiar with the Bank of America, the Wells Fargo's, you know, maybe the credit unions like Navy Credit Union or Delta Credit Union. But there are banks that specifically focus on international development, um, providing the resources necessary to grow and expand your business or look at opportunities for import and export or trade and commerce. So I've created this slide to talk a little bit about these banks with specific links. So if you know how to do a screenshot, uh, take a picture of this or use your camera and take a picture of this because these links would open up the opportunity to tap into additional resources for business trade and commerce. XM Bank, which really stands for export and import. If you're looking to bring commodities or trades, this is the United States arm for import and export. They love businesses in the U.S. that are looking to export commodities, whether it's agriculture or technology or infrastructure products into different parts of the world. This improves our uh, GDP when you're exporting on behalf of the United States. OPEC, when you're dealing in oil, you know, um, and exploring oil opportunities, natural gas. Um, Islamic Development Bank. I don't know if you all know, but there is an Islamic Development Bank that functions in over 50 countries around the world, providing Islamic financing, uh, Islamic grants, um, other opportunities to, to tap into debt facilities or private equity for developing around the world, especially in their member countries. UBA, the United Bank of Africa, is another um, global bank that provides financing in all 54 countries on the continent. The African Development Bank, similar to the World Bank, provides development opportunities. The Qatar Development Bank, um, they just uh, raised a billion dollars. You know, I was sitting in Saudi Arabia earlier this year, myself and a small delegation, Dr. Ali out of Mississippi, uh, Musa Dan Fodio here out of Atlanta. A couple of us flew in to participate in the Islamic Development Bank group meetings. And we were there when they raised $1 billion in 20 minutes. Phenomenal story. But being in a room and to witness how you can raise capital to do development projects and to help solve world problems. We just have to show up. Um, another one is the, de the, the Development Finance Corporation. This is a US-based um, investment arm for developing business all over the world. And then of course, private equity, raising capital within our community uh, to invest in specific projects globally. And private equity can be raised and developed, you know, through private placement memorandums or business plans. This is your typical, how do you raise capital to do business, domestic or abroad? So screenshot this one here is an excellent resource for tapping into debt facilities or development funds or import export funds to establish um, business opportunities abroad. Before we get into uh, specific opportunities, I want to just spend one minute on some of the risk. Uh, as business people, as investors, we should always explore political, economic, technical, and social risk by using a pest analysis to determine, you know, what are our exposure on these opportunities. Political climates, we all heard about government coups, you know, the uh, un a civil unrest in certain West African nations. Um, most recently, Senegal has some challenges because of elections. Sierra Leone has some challenges because of elections. So as a community, we have to understand what are the politics in these West African nations that could impact our investments, impact our business as we explore the possibilities of doing business abroad. What are the economic, you know, how do we tap into the exchange rates? Is the dollar strong? You know, are their currency strong? Are they moving to digital currency? Uh, what are the technological challenges? Um, do these countries have strong internet? Can we communicate? Do their banks go offline or online? You know, or, or are, are, are our dollars safe as we look to invest abroad? And then what are the social impact? Um, what does the workforce look like? Can we hire employees? Um, as a restaurateur, we've expanded our business recently into, um, I mean, really a couple of years ago into Mexico, and we had those challenges there. We have an office now in Dakar, and we have an office in Sierra Leone, where we are building bridges between those of us in the diaspora of African descent and those of us on the continent. 
Um, we're familiar with the image, and this is in my presentation in my PowerPoint back in the 60s, um, where there was an African American's hand reaching across the globe and connecting with our brothers and sisters from the continent. We are a living embodiment of that right now through technology, through our political relationships, through the tourism and the cultural exchange that we're doing. We're connecting now back to the continent, and now is an opportunity to build. We're also connecting with DNA. This is the first time in history that through African ancestry, we can trace our DNA back to the continent and confirm not only the country, but the tribe of our ancestors. So we can truly say that our history did not begin with slavery, right? We have a history before slavery and doing DNA, we can now connect. And that allows us to take advantage of the business opportunities. Through DNA, we can have dual citizenship. We can own business. We can own land. We can support elections. We can take advantage of uh, what's rightfully ours through our DNA. Most like other ethnicities, during the summer, they go back to Europe or they go back to Latin America or they go back home and bring resources back. They exchange, they set up business, they do trade and commerce back to their homeland. We now have that opportunity through you know, our DNA. Um, so uh, as it relates to Sierra Leone, um, please take a look at our African diaspora connect.com, but there are opportunities for knowledge transfer, for job creation, for investment in technology, for diplomacy engagement, and for foreign direct investment. And I want to talk a little bit about these industries. And I'm keeping it high level only because it's so much opportunity. We've heard third world countries. Um, what does that really mean? These are like uh, virgin countries that need everything in every industry. And Sierra Leone is one of those countries. When you think about the movie Blood Diamonds, right? They're known for mining of diamonds and gold. Uh, they've survived a war. And now the entire country needs to be redeveloped. Everything from infrastructure, uh, by that I mean roads and bridges, um, government buildings, commercial and real estate, and residential real estate. So when we look at these different uh, industries, they exist throughout West Africa. Unless you're talking about Nigeria or South Africa, or Ghana or Kenya, there are opportunities in all these industries. For example, oil and gas. Um, we're currently working on deals right now, myself and uh, Dr. Ali and my team uh, with the Office of Special Envoy. We forged strategic alliances with some of the largest oil and gas companies in America, and we're looking at ways to supply West African nations with fuel, jet fuel, with opening up gas stations, with creating franchises, bringing the restaurants over. This is just one industry with a tremendous opportunity. I was approached by His Excellency President Julius Matabil, the president of Sierra Leone. He said, Wally, we need about 20 gas stations in the southern part of our country. Can you bring developers over that know how to build gas stations with restaurants, with a retail, retail convenient component, and maybe some housing on the top? And if so, we can do 20 and then award government contracts to fuel military vehicles, airlines, government vehicles, et cetera. And that's just one industry. Uh, the exploration of commodities like diamonds and gold. These are regulated through the London Bullion Market Association, LNBA. And we can actually go into the earth and mine diamonds and mine gold, and the market tells you the value. These are commodities where you don't have to go in and manufacture, right, or produce, or you just extract it out of the earth and it has value on the market based on what you extract. And I'm excited to say I went into the diamond mines of Botswana, one of the largest mines in the world. I went into diamond mines in Sierra Leone and extracted natural resources and brought them back to the United States. These are real opportunities. Infrastructure, I talked about that briefly, building bridges and building uh, roads, there was an RFP out in Sierra Leone to build a bridge from Lungi into Freetown. That's a $1.2 billion construction opportunity. That will be a toll road. These are the type deals where you can generate revenue for the next 100 years plus. 
when you participate in large government uh, backed development of infrastructure. Right now you see the Chinese taking advantage of these opportunities. The Lebanese taking advantage of these opportunities. But African-Americans, we're not even at the table. We're not putting in bids. We're not exploring these possibilities. We're not exchanging globally on, on doing large scale infrastructure projects. But yet we have the capacity, right? We have large African-American owned development companies and construction companies that are building amazing things throughout the, con throughout the continent of the United States that we can take and do business on the continent of Africa. Um, next, commercial real estate. You know, this is just retail, building restaurants, building malls. In Sierra Leone, there are no malls. There are no American franchises. There are no movie theaters. You know, these are all opportunities. What you're passionate about here, you can go there and start from ground zero and create a whole new industry, a whole new opportunity, your family and for legacy. Housing and retail. Um, housing is just affordable housing. Bringing our innovation and our technology to the continent and duplicating uh, housing with metal and steel and, and prefab as opposed to everything being poured concrete. So these are opportunities in housing. Heavy equipment. When you think of um, big extractors or bobcats or trucks that carry equipment like dump trucks, all those are a need in West Africa. And typically you can rent this stuff for $1,000 a day. Could you imagine starting the business with one piece of equipment that would generate $30,000 a month just off of leasing? Um, so how do we do that? Buying a used piece of equipment, shipping it to the continent, and then leasing it to government projects or leasing it to the private sector, and then providing an engineer who can keep and maintain that and training them on how to operate and maintain it. So one piece of equipment, you're doing knowledge transfer, you're bringing in innovation and technology, and you're bringing in training and making $1,000 a day off of rent. So these are real opportunities that we're exploring. Tourism. This past December, we took a delegation of 47 people into, into Dakar. And by introducing them to several ministers, several sheikhs, we've increased tourism, we've bridged the gap, we've opened up opportunities for exchange, uh, not only be a culture exchange, but also be a business exchange. We had a business mixer, and several of our delegations have now started businesses, created a overseas bank accounts, and have returned to the continent, both Sierra Leone and Senegal, to conduct and trade in commerce. We have one gentleman um, launching or really procuring, buying a rice mill. Well, he'll be manufacturing, I mean, growing rice, manufacturing and packaging it, and then selling it to the government, the private sector, and doing exports of rice. So we're helping to navigate that. But it started with a cultural exchange program, joining a delegation to West Africa, visiting and exploring those possibilities, and then engaging in business. The transportation industry is another sector, very important. How are we moving products around the world? Logistics, right? Flight, um, ground transportation, sea transportation. In Sierra Leone, they've requested an air, land, and water solution, right? You know, how are we going to move people and products into the country and then people and products around the country and then people and, and products outside of the country? So there are opportunities for logistics and transportation throughout West Africa, understanding where the free trade zones are, how to engage in bilateral and trilateral agreements, and to tap into logistics and transportation opportunities. Everybody is aware of the agricultural opportunities. Um, right now, I'm working on a bilateral agreement between Florida a and University and Eastern Technical University in Sierra Leone, where we're le le using heads of academia in the agricultural mechanical industry, you know, Alabama AM, Fort Valley AM, or Fort Valley State University, Florida AM University. There are universities all over the country that specialize in agriculture where we can leverage our HBCUs here in the US, United States, historically black college and universities, with those African universities and exchange innovation, exchange technology, exchange academia. There are so many opportunities in agriculture. Myself and, and um, my team, we received two proposals on agriculture. And you're talking about 60 million, 80 million, $100 million proposals saying, hey, where's the innovation? How can we improve our agriculture? Is it in fertilizer? Is it in technology? Uh, we're using drones in the United States, right? For irrigation, for technology, for land development. 
in, in some countries on the continent, they're still using wheelbarrows and shovels and hoes and doing everything by hand. Now, could you imagine what can be shared from an innovation perspective? What can be shared from a technological perspective from our academic institutes and institutes there on the continent? So there, there are ways for us to engage very high level, leveraging what we have in the United States and understanding the challenges, but also the benefits of our brothers and sisters on the continent, and then bridging that gap. Import and export opportunities. Uh, several opportunities to engage with exporting American products, Brazilian products, you know, sugar, beef, um, wheat, corn, peanuts. When you think of the state you live in, what is the agricultural opportunities in that state? And how can we engage in exporting that to the continent and vice versa? You know, Imam Muhammad was importing shea butter, you know, 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. What products can we pull from the continent and import to the United States for our community? And, 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 and engaging in import and export is huge opportunities where millions of dollars are exported and import daily. Um, we had an opportunity to do a sugar deal just to give you an example, 25,000 metric tons, the commission on that could be four or 500,000 a month. What could our community do with a half a million dollar a month commission on an import export trade deal? Just think about that for a minute, right? If we're taking American products and exporting to West Africa and we can make a half a million dollars a month on that export deal or vice versa, bringing 25,000 or 50,000 metric tons of product from the continent and selling it to our community here in the United States, how much money can be made just off commission, not just made off the sales, but off of commission. Technology, the same thing. The West is known for technology, launching the internet, launching all the social media platforms, launching the uh, iPhones. You know, when we could take this technology and participate in the marketplace, it, it doesn't matter. People don't ask, do you have a felony? Do you have a background? Are you black or white? Are you Muslim or Christian? They just click on that link, put in a credit card and say buy, right? <laughs> so when you have an online market platform, you're not just selling in your city. We're moving from vending in within our masjid to selling products and services all over the globe through a marketplace. So we have to tap into utilizing technology within our community to benefit the entire globe. And then of course, consulting leveraging our intellect, our acumen, our experience, and sharing that knowledge to foreign governments, to foreign companies, and being paid high level as a consultant. As African-Americans, we're known for sports. We're known for entertainment. Um, Post-Obama, you know, now that Obama has become president, the world can see us now as intellectuals, as leaders, and as entrepreneurs. And when we begin to show up now, because the rest of the world is, is um, tribal, they could consider us as part of the Obama tribe, the tribe of intellectuals, the tribe of leaders, and the tribe of entrepreneurs. So we have a mandate to now express ourselves in the language of business, global business. How many jobs have you created? Oh, I got 300 employees. I got 500 employees. I got 1,000 employees. Oh, excellent. How many products have you created? Oh, we have true products. We have Black-owned toothpaste, toothbrushes, you know, beard uh, uh, creams, you know, shea butters, et cetera. Oh, excellent. We have uh, businesses in retail that we can expand. We have, you know, 15, 20 locations of this, 15, 20 locations of that. You become a global contributor of jobs, of opportunities, of business, and you have something to give back to humanity through legacy. Right. How many trust fund babies have we created? How many of our children now have um, a legacy through business and through entrepreneurship that now they're not starting from ground zero? This is the mindset that we have to take into the world. We have to show up, show up as businessmen and women, show up as contributors to humanity, show up to do business and exchange, uh, show up to represent what, who we are and what we're doing in America. These are investment opportunities. I had uh, I have created a small model here. Uh, we don't have time to go into depth, but it, it talks about what money leads to. Money, 
There are three ways to make money. Work hard, get others to work hard, get your money to work hard. Working hard, we got that down. Working a nine to five, getting a job. Getting others to work hard is becoming an entrepreneur. The stat says for every one person you hire, you should generate another $250,000 in revenue. We can't be afraid to hire people to work for our money. If you're, not, if you're not working for yourselves and working for your money, then you're working for somebody else and you're building their return on investment. You're building their net income. You're building their legacy. You're building their trust funds, right? And then getting others to work hard, entrepreneurship and getting your money to work hard. Money leads to affluence, affluence to influence, influence to power, power to production and production to respect. I wrote a whole book on this. We'll make the link available. But the piece here is in production, when you're becoming businessmen and women and business owners, you now have land, you own the land, you're now manufacturing, you're creating products, you now have a distribution and logistics entity where you're moving products throughout the world, you're wholesaling products, you're retailing products, and you're selling all this to the end user, the consumers. So this model is very important as we engage in business. I had the opportunity I was sharing early on, for those of you who all are just joining, myself, Dr. Ali, Attorney Musa Danfodio, we had an opportunity to participate in the group um, of meetings sponsored in part by the Islamic Development Bank. This was in Saudi Arabia. We were in a meeting where they raised $1 billion in 20 minutes. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the president was there and said, hey, I want to invest a hundred million dollars to help you know Africa solve problems. The second, per he said. Also, he said, if anyone wants to increase that, I'll match it dollar for dollar. The Qatar Development Bank stood up and said, I'll match it uh, and raise and 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 commit to hundred and fifty million dollars to help Africa solve you know problems. So you have Bill and Melinda Gates with a hundred million, the Qatar Development with 150 million, and then an African woman, I believe she was from Sudan, she stood up and said, I pledge $250 million because Africa should solve African problems. I, I almost jumped out of my seat to see an, a Black African woman stand up and pledge $250 million because Africa should solve African problems. Now, now bring that home. How many African Americans do you see standing up committing $250 million for African Americans to solve African American problems? How profound is that? So I'm sitting there as an ambassador of trade and investment, where I'm in the room where everybody is referring to me as His Excellency, Wally Shamsuddin. And I have my own delegation of African Americans, and we're exploring possibilities to engage. Because of my ambassador ambassadorship, I was able to meet with the heads of each one of these organizations on one-on-one. -on -one. Myself, Dr. Ali, and Attorney Musa Danfodio. We met with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We met with the Qatar Development Authority. We met with uh, the Islamic, the president of the Islamic Development Bank. And we're having now conversations on what we can do for our own community here domestically. And there are thoughts and ideas being exchanged, like why not establish an Islamic Development Bank of America, right? What would that look like for African-American Muslims to launch our own bank, an Islamic Bank of America? We're exploring those possibilities and we'll have some announcements of that coming up with our economic roundtable in Mississippi next week. We're exploring the possibilities of creating jobs and bringing Islamic finance into America, Islamic insurance, Islamic banking, Islamic home buying, Islamic private equity, Islamic all cost trust and funds to fund our social enterprises. Just for showing up, how many of us are participating in, in the world trade shows, in the world economic fundings, and go to the United Nations each year, engage with our Minister of Foreign Affairs, register with the U.S. Embassy and talk about trade shows and trade delegations and visited other countries around the world. These are all things that we're doing now through my leadership, through my ambassadorship, through my office, through several small businesses who have joined me on different delegations. We're now engaging 
in the world economics. We're attending world economic forums. We're bringing the voice that has been missing for over 400 years now, right? By showing up. The question I get is, where have you been? Where, where has the voice of the African-American man and woman been on the global scene? Why are we not coming to these conferences and lending our expertise? Why are we not engaging in government contracts globally? Why are we not participating on global requests for proposals and requests for quotes to do business and create jobs and opportunity? This is how our community engaged. How many of us was at the United Nations General Assembly this past week? How many of us engage, not just from a political perspective, but from a business perspective? So this is our time for engagement. I participated in the, um, the Dakar 2 Summit back in Dakar a few months back. And this is world hunger, alleviating world hunger, alleviating food insecurity. The world knows that Africa would feed the rest of the world. And now they're there. It was 5,000 people in Dakar for this conference exchanging on business plans and business ideas on how their countries can be fed by Africa, right? <laughs> what we can do to improve agriculture on the continent to feed the rest of the world. We should be at these conferences with our delegations. We had an opportunity uh, to meet the Malaysian delegation. And it was very interesting uh, because of protocol, the, the minister of finance and myself as an ambassador, we exchange. He had a delegation of about 10. I had a delegation of about five. And we're talking about how can we engage and build bridges between Malaysia and African-Americans? How can we learn more and engage more about Islamic finance and Islamic banking? How can we share our plight and grow from our plight of the struggle that African-Americans have had and, and build from that struggle and become more contrib contributors on the global scene? After that conversation, the minister uh, from the Malaysian delegation, he said, may I ask you a question? I said, yes. He said, Ugh. and I, I felt a little uneasy because we we're at high level discussions at this uh, group of meetings in, in Saudi Arabia representing uh, banking and finance and economic empowerment. But I said, of course. And once the minister gave me a hug, his whole delegation had to hug my whole delegation. And it was a beautiful exchange because he understood our plight and our sacrifice and our struggle and what we've been through. And now that we have arrived in a sense that we're at the table discussing banking and financing and job creation and entrepreneurship, he welcomed us with open arms and said, if you're interested, you can send some of your students, five or six students every year. And we'll teach them Islamic banking and finance so that they can go back and run banking inst institutes in America. He sent an invitation for us to join him based on the history that we've had in the past with Malaysia and new opportunities that we presented. And then the behind the scenes meetings come the real question. How do you allow the same people who oppressed you to educate you? We have to pause for that. Are all African-American women what we see on Housewives? You have to pause for that. How do you allow the same people who oppressed you to give you medical uh, services or legal services, right? The real question behind that is where are the Islamic hospitals? Where are the Muslim businesses that are creating services for our seniors and our youth? Where are our Muslim schools and colleges and universities? Where are our African-American Muslim-owned establishments in America? These are the questions we get after the big meetings, right? They want to engage with us and, and identify with our plight, how we survive, and how we are now creating business and industry in America, in the West where they can barely practice the deen. Understand, when you're in Muslim countries, you hear the Adan five times a day, you hear it all out in the streets, and wherever people are, they stop and pray right there on the spot. The malls, the businesses, the streets, right there. Do Juma all across the country. 
when you're in America, you have to call the Adon if you want to hear it. It's not over loudspeakers all over the city and the whole country is not shutting down. So they ask, how can you practice the deen in America? A lot of them come over and change their name from Muhammad to Mo or from Shamsuddin to Sam to integrate, not to really build on what we've been blessed with. So when we show up, there's a curiosity. We're welcome with open arms. They want to exchange with us. They want to do business with us. They want to learn from our plight. They want to develop and support us in creating jobs and opportunities. Here are some of the current deal flows that we're working on. Um, a 20-unit gas station expansion in Sierra Leone, that's about 25 million USD. A rice mill in Sierra Leone, that's about 3.5 million. An agricultural and farmer project in Dakar, that's 180 million. Oil and gas distribution projects with the largest um, oil and gas company in the U.S. shipping um, oil and gas into Sierra Leone. We're working on commodity export projects between Brazil and West Africa. We're working on the Islamic banking project between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the U.S. And then, of course, the, the internships that we have um, identified for Malaysia, for Islamic Development Bank. And also we have some internships opportunities uh, in oil and gas as well. So we'll be announcing and promoting this stuff, Dr. Ali and myself, through um, our economic empowerment tour. We'll be speaking at um, in Mississippi, and also we're working closely with Sister Aisha Mustafa, and we'll be doing some presentations at a time to be grateful, continuing to explore international opportunities, the deal flow, and how our community can engage, can invest, can be employed, can travel, can exchange in culture, to participate in trade delegations, and to continue to build legacy and take advantage of the diplomatic opportunities we have through our office and through our deal flow. My link, my social media um, handles on Instagram, on Facebook, my websites, screenshot this, take a picture, we'll drop it in the chat. Um, and then I wanna um, pause for, for questions and answers on ways we can do delegations, ways we can do foreign direct investment, and ways we can do uh, job creation and knowledge transfer. So Sister Fitcher, this concludes my slideshow presentation. I hope I didn't go over time, but no. I did want to share some stories and share some insights and share some deal flow. And then I can open up for Q&A. Okay, so help me out here because there are some questions in the chat. Why don't you... Uh, just kind of look at them and uh, answer those that um, uh, you can respond to. Uh, okay. So um, let's see. You know, uh, when, when you talk about uh, these kinds of trades and you use these big numbers, um, you know, they're impressive to many, um, but I'm a grassroots person. And uh, uh, while you're looking at the questions, once you uh, get to a question that you wanna answer, uh, just let me know. I'm a grassroots person. And so um, I wanna know uh, what kind of entity has been set up for those who might be interested and need some consultation. Because as you pointed out, doing business in Africa is extremely risky. So that's a that's a great question. Um, usually you start by registering with the US Chamber of Commerce and the embassy in that country. And when you bring deals to the table, because uh, you're an American citizen with an American passport, you have the complete uh, disposal of the U.S. government. They will vet those international companies, make sure they're not any on, on any watch list, uh, make sure they're viable business owners and entrepreneurs. They will uh, introduce you to the local chamber of commerce in each country and then help navigate that process. So you, so, you register here with the, uh, here? Yes, mm -hmm. the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And then in the country that you want to do business with, the embassy, the U.S. embassy in that country. Okay. And they will they will receive you as an American citizen and help you set up meetings. Um, okay. There are there are some fees associated with that, um, but that's why we went over into West Africa and set up our own office. We have an office in Dakar, Senegal. 
We have an office in Freetown, Sierra Leone. So when African-Americans want to do business in one of those two countries, we're the first port of contact. And we'll walk you through that process. Your company? My company, yeah. Champs okay, Adina, then. SDA. Okay, so um, let's see. What is the minimum financial investment required to enter the international business opportunity you're presenting? Um, I think some of these questions uh, probably need to be a one-on-one -on -one or through email. Uh, what is your email address where people, I know you put that up. I just want to make sure people have that email address because- I'll drop it in the chat there. Waleed at sdassoc.com. Okay. Yes. I want to be part of this venture. How do how do I and who do I get in contact with? So we have- um... Dr. Ali out of New Medina, you may know Doc. He and I have been working very close together. And, and just two minutes on Doc. Phenomenal serial entrepreneur, built uh, New Medina over 600 acres, um, owns multiple clinics, gas stations, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But we've worked very closely together. He's joined me on a couple of delegations internationally. And we're now creating a new entity. Right now, it's just NUCO. But that this entity will allow those in our community who want to participate in oil and gas and what we're doing uh, in terms of expanding multiple. We got a 40 unit location, 20 domestic and 20 abroad to participate in this. Uh, we've been hosting two major companies in the U.S. who have already given us a preliminary commitment to launch gas stations both. You just froze. You are frozen, um, Ambassador Walid. I'm a dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. I have been appointed a chief of my local tribe in Sierra Leone. And through the protections of the Vienna Conventions, my office can contact any office in the world and I'll get a response. This may, this may be the first time in history that an African-American Muslim has received a diplomatic appointment from a foreign sitting president. That gives our community access. We have power now. I can call uh, President Macky Sall in Senegal. I can call the president of Nigeria. I can call the president of uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Not only would they re respond, they would send an invitation for us to bring a delegation over to talk about trading investment. So while I hold this position and have this level of access, we have to take advantage of the opportunities. So when we reached out to one of the largest oil and gas companies and shared the credentials, who I am, who Doc is, and what we're doing, not only did they accept our call, they invited us to Texas. We went and met with the whole C-suite, the president, the chief of marketing, the chief of food and beverage, and they laid out a deal that says, okay, you want 40 gas stations, here it is, 20 US, 20 abroad, and we'll support you to create jobs and opportunities. So regardless of the industry, we have that access to do business on the continent. I, I wanna encourage those who are in attendance today to please write uh, Ambassador Wally, because we're not gonna get through all of these questions. They're too extensive and they really need uh, elaboration so you can understand. I see Sister Latifah's hand is up, Masha, if you can know. When you use the word participant, are you saying invest financially in the company, Nuka? Walid, uh, uh, Walid, are you frozen? Yes, you are. He's frozen again. Uh, let's, uh, so while he's trying to get unfrozen. I wanna encourage those who are interested to please be in contact with him directly uh, to answer your questions. And I wanna, I really wanna stress that doing business in Africa, Africa is very risky, but uh, it's not impossible. Allah is the best knower. Uh, and of course, having knowledge and, um, and direct contact makes a difference. Uh, I mean, he is in position uh, to get answers. Um, I'm sure he's going out to come back in. Uh, he is in position to uh, get your questions answered, um, but you do have to have extensive knowledge and consultation uh, 
doing business anywhere where you can't just show up uh, the day of uh, and inquire, see for yourself with your own eyes. So um, though these numbers are impressive, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm not impressed by very much uh, because the reality is, is that if you are not having um, access to what is going on um, in Africa, then you, you, you really, you really are running a risk of investing. Now, Ambassador Waleed, with that yes. said, I do understand by you having access, and I certainly know Dr. Ali and trust both of you. Uh, I know Dr. Ali has like four degrees, four yeah. PhDs. I mean, yeah. I had dinner with him and his wife, and I was so impressed by his knowledge. Yeah. However, however, you know the the, the you know it, it's important that you know that this kind of investments. Uh, these big numbers that you're throwing out, uh, we don't want people to get disillusioned. We want people to know that uh, it takes information and 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 um, uh, access to understand what is really going on before they begin to make investments. Right. So I say that to say, uh, I I consider myself if if you're looking at these questions. Uh, please, I consider myself a, a contact in this community, our nationwide community. But I've, I haven't heard any of these uh, uh, projects that you are referring to. And I want to know why. <laughs> I want to know Wait. why is it that Study Al Islam with almost, with one of the most uh, 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 social uh, connections in our community, we don't know about these things because I suddenly don't know about them. Yes, yes, yes. We're we're just now getting to a point where we can speak publicly about them. Okay. Um, first, when any deal comes to us, being an ambassador, we have to vet them. Um, very easily, you can get in, in, in touch with people who may be funding terrorists or doing all kind of stuff that we can't engage with. And being Black and Muslim, we have to go through the vetting process. And then once we clear that, there is a process called KYC, Know Your Client. And that gets into the banking relationships, the feasibilities, the net worth, et cetera. And then once we get it, the, the, the deal is viable and real and all the parties are have integrity, then we can bring them forth to the community. So we're just now getting at that point where we'll be making the announcements. Actually, you all are the first to hear about what we're doing with the gas stations, the oil and gas, the Islamic Development Bank, et cetera. But we'll be promoting that heavily in the next couple of weeks through Muslim Journal and through the conferences and through the a Time to Be Grateful as well. And we hope that you will also connect with Study Al Islam's newsletter and make those announcements. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, will you have time to do an orientation for new participants in these ventures? Yes, we we will make time for that. We will set that up, and 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 it, it'll be private for our community first to be um, to participate in these ventures. Okay. Before Are we you... open it up to African Americans? We're being called now by athletes and entertainers and others. You know, people of extreme high net worth that say, hey, we got a half a million and we got a million dollars. How can we engage? How can we invest? How can we be a part of this? But we want our community to be the first participants before we tap into other H high net worth individuals outside of our community. Uh, are you or do you have access to the director general of the World Trade Organization? Um, we have not tried to approach them, but you know we can. WTO is you know World Trade Organization, uh, USAID, the World Bank, these are all participants of these global conferences that I'm attending. So it's just a matter of time before we cross circles or I can be intentional about making those connections. When Okay. And uh, so we're going to be looking forward to hearing more from you from a cultural perspective. Uh, a lot of this is very technical. The businesses that you uh, have mentioned, the oil business, uh, the banking business, uh, and we have a lot, we have, a, a, you know, a, a, an array of, Sister Latifa, I see you with your hand up. Are you off mute? Because I want to acknowledge your question. Thank you, my dear sister. Okay, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Brother Ambassador, thank you so much for this information. Mm -hmm. We have to use it. 
Um, yeah. At the top of your presentation, you said uh, talking about the investment opportunities. You said it's not available in Ghana, Nigeria, and another com uh, country, at least another country. Why is that? No, I said that I said that um, the third world opportunities where you can go into any industry or those less developed. And I mentioned that Ghana, uh, Kenya, South Africa, these are very developed nations. It's like living in the United States. They got skyscrapers, technology, infrastructure. I'm talking about the greater opportunities are those less developed. Right. Oh, it wasn't under, because uh, I heard under the investment opportunities when you were speaking, yes. you jotted it down then. So that's what you're saying? Yes. Thank you, my dear brother, for making it clear. For yeah. this. <laughs> if, there, if there's anyone else that want to ask a question, please raise your hand so we can acknowledge it because there's just too many questions on the chat. Um, so, uh, Wally, Ambassador Wally, we're going to be looking forward to uh, Sister Vonda, are you off of mute? Please just state your question. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Uh -huh. I was wondering is there a Muslim business directory? If so, what is the directory information so I can register my business? I'm not I'm not aware of a, a directory, a Muslim business directory that's highlighting all of the businesses in America. That's something that's needed. You know, an app with all the businesses, how many jobs we create, how many members we have in our community. That's stuff you can leverage for politics and for business globally. But that's something that's needed. Uh, Naomi, please, if you're off mute, ask your question. Yes, I sound like and thank you for your presentation. I was you mentioned the economic development tour. Uh, and that's in Mississippi, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Is that something that's going to be moving across the country? And is do you have any plans to come to North Carolina? Thank we you. we have three cities. We're starting New Medina uh, October 14th. That weekend It's the New Medina Roundtable. Um, we're doing a time to be grateful. Uh, for the conference in, I think it's in New Jersey this year. And then um, Imam Hanif has invited us down to Albany, Georgia. And then we're working on Atlanta as well. So right now, those are the four cities. But it's very high level, um, specific about economic development, economic empowerment, global business opportunities, where we're promoting these opportunities to our community and looking for ways to have our community engage. So who's invited to those? Uh, it's open. Anybody okay. that wants to participate, yeah, you can meet us in any one of these cities and be uh, be a part of it. We okay, expect so, over 100 people in New Medina, uh, over 100 people in uh, in Imam Hanif's piece, and yeah, of course, a time to be grateful. Half the community be there. Okay, so we, uh, I hope to get those dates and who the target market is for yes. those specific meetings to uh, to promote in the newsletter. Absolutely, uh, Zakia, if you are off mute, ask your question. Yes, please. Um, Alhamdulillah, thank you so much, um, Imam Ambassador. Um, now, this is a question, it has to do with the United States. Right yes. now, they're talking about our money being at risk in these banks. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to control your money. Um, you won't be able to have access to it. Do you have any, can you, can, is there something that you can say to us? Let's say, do we rush to the bank and take our money out of the bank? What do we, mm -hmm. what do we do? First of all, that's a great question. And this is something that, that my wife and family, we've been discussing for years. And that was one of the driving force for us to create new opportunities outside of the United States, especially during COVID, when 45 was in office and they had the ban on Blacks, the ban on Africans. That was a disruptor because I have international in, in, uh, investors investing in my business. So personally, what I did was created new bank accounts outside of the United States. I have, you know, accounts in Mexico, accounts on the continent, Sierra Leone, Dakar, and most businesses that are looking to engage in international businesses look for that. When we took our delegation to Dakar, we had a banker come right in and speak to the delegation, and they was able to set up overseas accounts right on the spot. Now, you do have to report income earned back to the United States, pay taxes or repatriate your funds, but you can have an international account. I listed several banks in my presentation, United Bank of Africa. Um, I don't know, city, you know, has banks abroad, but you do want to just diversify your portfolio a bit. So if anything's happened in the United States, you have resources outside of the country. Um, and then there are several that are Muslim owned banks like the Islamic Development Bank. Th those can only have member countries through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but there are banks that will allow individuals and individual businesses to bank abroad. 
And we should uh, we should absolutely be exploring that as a community. Uh, Brother Alamein, uh, ask your question, please. And let's try to keep these brief because we only have a few more minutes. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief. First, thank you for your presentation. For those of us that are small investors, do you have a structure for us to be able to block our investments with maybe 10 people to make one major investment into your ventures going forward? Thank you, sir. Absolutely. You can set up an LLC, pool your resources, and then have one person, the managing partner of the LLC, serve as a liaison uh, for what we're doing. Abdul Rahman, Imam, is that Imam Abdul Rahman? Please ask your question, Brother Imam. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Hey, what's up? Am I on mute? No, no we, we can hear you. Ask okay. your question. Yeah, I'm somewhat, I'm somewhat late sliding on, but I have, I have an interest in connecting uh, African American farmers with African farmers. Yes. And uh, perhaps uh, engaging them in the possibility, the opportunity to create contracts to help the developing countries uh, grow food and uh, et cetera. So uh, you may have commented on, I may have missed it. Could you give me, could you give me some comments on that, please? Yeah. Um, first, we are engaging in a bilateral agreement between Dakar and the United States that's focusing on farmers, um, agriculture, aquaculture, uh, and farming of cattle and looking to exchange innovation and technology. We're working closely with Ambassador Fode Seik, who is a friend of our community. And we're looking at ways to engage them in the Delta, you know, where a lot of farming is going on and creating bilateral agreements between HBCUs that focus on agriculture and those institutes on the continent that focus on agriculture. So there are a number of touch points there. Um, we've, we've even gotten orders for 25,000 metric tons of sugar and wheat and corn where it's difficult to source from our black farmers. So we had to go to Brazil, but those are opportunities for us to collaborate as well. Um, and, and we're looking for um, ways to innovate, whether it's fertilizers or feeds that we can supply the continent that's based in, in the United States. So that's a conversation we could take offline and I can pull you into our team to have those conversations as well. But we're, we're engaged in agriculture on, on a daily basis now. Sister Bahija, take yourself off of you. Ask your question. That's like um. What's on? First of all, I said like oh, Ambassador Wally. I didn't know, <laughs> didn't realize it was you this morning. Yeah. Um, I I would like to get more inf more information and get more involved in it, especially for the one in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to do more, and I wanted to with the banking thing. Um, I wanted to find out for for those. That sister, like Sister Zakia was saying, for those that are um, can't go and do, how do we go about to do that online? Mm -hmm. Can we still get those accounts and do those things if we don't travel off off things so to for that? And then if, what happens if we get out of our money from the state, like the uh, our um, what is the thing um. Social Security and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And with this going on with the bank, how is there a way that we can maneuver around that? I'll, I'll put together some banking resources and then I can share that with the community through study Al-Islam um, because I have several that I can share that will make this a seamless process for our community. Sister Najma, ask your question, please. Yes, Aslam alaikum, brother ambassador. Hey, what's up? First of all, I want to appreciate you and thank you for your presentation. I have a quick question with the discussion. I think this is what Sister Zakir was asking about. There's discussion about the dollar being replaced by a, a central bank digital coin. And if we put money into other accounts in other countries, what would be the currency of those countries? They're, they're looking to transition to back that by gold. Um, so we're, we're tapping into the, the commodity industry as well. I have a mandate with um, a gold refinery in Dakar. It's the largest refinery. It's about a $10 million facility. They've issued me a mandate in support of that refinery. And through that, they are buying gold right from the mines, refining it based on the London bullion market. And then they put in a safe called SKR, safekeeping receipts. They can monetize the gold. So when we talk about exploring where to park our funds, we'll put it in currencies that are backed by commodities. And it, you get into some complications, but again, we could we can come on with um, 
an expert in this field and have them present to our community and entertain those questions before we make any moves. I think more than anything, the credentials we now have in our community gives us gives us access to people, to industries, to government, and to experts that now we can invite to participate and present to our communities. And we're doing that at these economic forums as well. Members of the Islamic Development Bank, uh, members from foreign nationals like Dakar and Sierra Leone, they all come in, they pipe in, they Zoom in and share information that could help benefit our community. Uh, with that, uh, Brother Walid, we have come to the end of uh, this program. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of interest um, in, uh, in what you're doing. And, I, and, and, and again, um, you know, I would caution people, uh, and I'm sure you would support this, that you uh, should pursue that which you have some knowledge about. Yes. Uh, because, um, uh, uh, you know, investing uh, requires uh, some uh, some knowledge in the field that you are investing in. I'll never forget a story of a brother who opened up a salon, hair salon, and he had no idea how to do hair. And when none of his uh, people showed up, he was closed. Uh, they, you know, so if you don't know what you are investing in, if you don't have prior knowledge to it, don't depend on other people. You have to have knowledge of some fundamental knowledge and interest in what you are putting your money in and those who you are investing with. So you need to know Brother Wali, you need to know uh, Brother Ali, uh, Dr. Ali, and many of you already know Aisha in terms of her. Uh, I don't know what part she's playing in this, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in terms of this whole investment, but know the people that you are dealing with. Aisha is in the, is in the newspaper business. Uh, Brother Ali is an ambassador. Dr. Ali, I can tell you, uh, has all kinds of credentials. But again, you need to know who you're investing with. And, 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 and Waleed, I know you understand that uh, it's important because you're giving this information out on Study Al-Islam that uh, I am not encouraging anyone uh, uh, to invest in anything with anybody without you having prior knowledge and vetting them yourself. That's right, that's right. That's right. So with that said, I'm gonna close, I'm gonna close with a few announcements. First of all, I wanna to say to you, uh, that, uh, you know, we are forever grateful uh, to have you as part of this community. Mm -hmm. uh, we make dua for you that you will keep the best interests of this community and mm -hmm. not be driven uh, by the uh, uh, by uh, uh, opportunity to exploit, uh, uh, but to remember uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you and bless you to be successful. And Imam Muhammad said, the money will come. That is not the goal and objective, but it is to our responsibility is to see to it that our people are free. Mm -hmm. uh, you have six children growing up in this community and no one will love those children more than we do. So Thank we you. expect the very best out of you. Um, you and your wife. I don't want to leave her out because she's an intricate part uh, of the success that you are experiencing. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. So with that said, I do want people to know that I did take my DNA. Uh, I am from the, on my mother's side from, I'm a part of the Kaniri tribe in Nigeria. So I know where I get my spirit from. Uh, uh, if anybody has been to Hajj and seen the Nigerian people, you know you better get out of the way. <laughs> so when you get ready to do things with Nigeria, I hope that you will remember me. Um, with that said, I want to make a few announcements. Uh, you did receive the Study of Islam schedule for October in the newsletter. Uh, please take time to review it. Uh, this recording will be in next Saturday's Study of Islam newsletter for one week so you can review it. Um, as many uh, times as, as you like. Also, uh, uh, Brother Walid and I and his wife, who 
uh, is will be taking, who is out front with this idea, is the, that we are looking at planning a trip to Ghana in 2024. So it'll be a partnership between Study Al Islam and uh, Brother Walid and his wife's uh, uh, company. Um, so if you uh, have an interest in, in, in visiting Ghana in 2024, send me an email. Uh, of course, we will do uh, the, the, the common, uh, uh, we will be touring, you know, the Cape Coast Castle overlooking the Atlantic Ocean, a former slave trade outpost, the door of no return. Uh, we will meet with other African-Americans who are now living in Ghana and who will share their experience uh, living abroad and working. Uh, you know, we'll visit the the, the institution uh, home of W.E.B. Du Bois, who lived uh, to be 93 years old in Ghana and participate in many ceremonies under the stars and, you know, eat and dance to the drums. Uh, so uh, please, uh, uh, you can see my experiences have been all social in Ghana, no business, <laughs> but there will be a business component uh, with having uh, Walid and his wife uh, as partners with Study Al Islam, as well as visit a local uh, masjid uh, to attend Juma. Uh, so, um, uh, with that said, uh, I, I do want to remind you uh, to make sure that uh, you read the newsletter because there's a lot of information. And also, uh, the Study Al Islam website does have a directory and it is uh, in categories. So please send me your photo and your bio so we can put you on uh, that, uh, on the directory. It's growing and uh, I'm willing to share information with anyone else who is also um, uh, planning to publish a directory. The directory for Study Al Islam is on the website, but I see that there is a group on here that intends to publish a directory. And I would be more than happy to share that information with you. With that said, I wanna say to you, um, we look forward to you being with us next week. I am your sister and friend, Fitra Muhammad. Uh, uh, Brother Omar, if you would close us in prayer. Brother Omar, are you with us? Imam Sharif, can you close us in prayer, please? Brother Brother Omar is on mute, so I, he, I don't okay. know if that we can't hear him. Brother Omar, can you take yourself off of mute? Walid, I know you're going to be getting a lot of emails, so I... I I hope you have someone set up to yes. <laughs> receive them. <laughs> they can text too on WhatsApp. It's fine. Text or email us. I like to answer all the questions in the chat. So if of someone course. can send me those, we'll get those answered as well. Okay, then. No Brother problem. Omar, are you with us? Imam Sharif, please close us in prayer so we can close the program. Imam Abdul Sharif. Yes, ma'am. Please close us in prayer. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Narrahman Rahim, Maliki Yawmid Din. Iyya kana abudu wa iyya kana sari'in, ihdina sirata mustarkeen. Sirata al-ladhina anamta alayhim, ayril ma'aduwi alayhim, wala dalim. Amen. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.